Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. My name is Lisa, and I have been Bigfoot researching now for about 23 years. I've been with the BFRO, the GCBRO, the Monkey Chasers, which no longer exist, the TBRC. I even started my own group for a little while called Apes. thought that was cute because that stood for Arkansas Primate Encounter Studies. But most recently, I have joined up with the Bigfoot and Female Friends of the South. And now I run a podcast called Cryptids Unlimited. And you can find it at cryptidsunlimitedpodcast.com. But my Bigfoot sighting happened when I was 10 years old. I was living in Claiborne Parish, Louisiana. We were staying at my grandparents' house. My mom and dad had split up and we had had to move in there and a little bit of the layout of the land we had chickens we had pigs we had a huge garden full of watermelons and and all kinds of things and it started off with my grandmother she was hunting one day with my aunt and my mother and she had gone into a large thicket And she thought she heard a deer because something was making a huffing noise in this thicket. And so she thought, well, I'm waiting on this big buck to come out. So she she sat down on her haunches and um, she waited. She had her gun ready. She was waiting. And instead of a deer coming out, this thing screamed at her so loud and with such force. It scared her so bad. She ended up trying to run away but she ended up falling and she tumbled down a hill she skid herself up she was in bad shape by the time she got back to my mom and my aunt well after that we were told as kids don't ever go down into the woods again because we used to play in the woods all the time that was our we'd go outside every day we'd make forts in the woods we ran barefoot through the woods you know this was This was our thing we did as children. That's where we stayed all day long. But now she's like, don't go back in the woods because there's something else out there. And, you know, us being children, I lived there, but my sister didn't. She lived with my dad and she would come over on weekends and she came over one weekend and she brought her best friend with her, Mary. My sister's name's Mary, Mary and Mary. We all took off down past the second cattle guard, which is specifically where they told us not to go. And that's where the woods, the woodline started. So we took off into the woodline. Well, as we got there, we smelled something and it smelled horrible. And to us, it smelled like something dead, a dead animal. So we thought, well, the neighbor over there has cows. Maybe one has wandered over here And it has died and we're smelling it. So we kind of blew it off. But when we went to take two more steps towards the wood line, right as we stepped into it, something growled at us with a deep guttural growl. And it was not on the ground. It was high up in the air. And that scared us so bad. We ran barefoot back up the rocky road and don't even remember, don't even remember running back. But we told our, my mom, and of course, we got in trouble for going down there where we weren't supposed to be. 
nothing about, you know, something growled at us, just you weren't supposed to be down there. So later, me and my mom and my stepdad, which my mom had remarried by now, went down to that area where something had growled at us. And in a, we were walking back in the woods and we found this, I don't even know what to call it. It was a, I called it a fort as a kid. Something had made a fort and it was big. It was taller than me. It was branches and vines woven all in together to create this big, like circular thing, kind of like a beaver's dam would look, but with this big door in the front. And inside it was this pine straw that was all packed down. And my mom and my stepdad said, what, do we have like a, a, a hobo living out here behind the house? And, you know, we kind of thought that's what it was. Somebody passing through had made a little hut for them to stay in. But then we noticed outside the hut, right on one side was a pile of bones. And judging by, you know, the size of them and everything, we decided they were bird bones. Possibly chicken. You know, I don't know if we had chickens come up missing then or not, but we decided they were possibly chicken bones. And on the other side of the doorway, in another neat little stack, were the feathers from the bird. So on one side, we had a stack of bones, and on the other side, we had a stack of feathers, and they were neatly stacked. And, well, we couldn't figure out, you know, how somebody would have sat there and ate a raw chicken. So that was kind of weird. But again, we just didn't know what it was. So later, a few nights later, my stepdad worked graveyards. So he was always gone at night. He drove a truck. And one night, as my grandmother was locking up the house, she had gone to the sliding glass patio doors to lock the patio door. Well, she screamed and come running and she said, there's a black man out there. Well, apparently what she had seen was standing, there was a light on the my granddad's shop where he worked on cars. He had since passed away, but the light was still there and it would shine towards the sliding glass door. It would light up the backyard and the front yard a little bit. And what she saw was standing in front of that light. So she just saw the silhouette of something big and black. So she called the police, but where we lived, it took the police 30 minutes to get there. And by the time they got there, they looked around and they couldn't find anything. It had already left. But right after that, I was sitting out on the porch with my grandmother. It was like two or three nights later. And it was, you know, after dark, it wasn't that late, but it was after dark. And I had gone inside to get something. And when I came back out, she was hysterical and she was hollering, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? And I said, did I see what? I didn't see anything. And she said, something just walked across that field right there and stepped over that fence. And we asked her after she calmed down what she saw. She said something really tall was walking on two legs and it wasn't a man, she said, and that it had walked across the field and had stepped over a fence without even slowing down. And this was like a, a four foot barbed wire fence and just kept walking off into the woods, went across the road the road where we had heard the growl went across that road and into the woods on the other side. Well, we went down the next day to look and see what she had said she saw, see if it left any sign. And we did find some hair on the fence where she said it stepped over. It was about five inches long and it was dark brown and it smelled really bad, really bad. There were tracks where you could see that it had stepped over. You couldn't see any in the grass where the field was, but where it had stepped over the fence into the little ditch area on the other side of the fence. We found this track 
there and then we found another one like there were it was a small road and you like had just two tire tracks that went down this dirt road and this dirt road didn't go anywhere it just went to a well about maybe a quarter mile down past our house it dead ended and it had a turnaround spot and you know the well man's the only one that ever went down there and he went like once a week but this track was Oh, it's so hard to explain it. It only had three toes, but it was huge. I mean, it was really big. And the closest that I've ever seen to looking like this was the Missouri monster. It looked like a regular foot, but like two toes are missing on your foot. It was like three toes, a big one, a medium size and a small one across the top. No claws or anything, just just three toes didn't make any sense to us we were like we don't know what these are and we walked on down the road and found more tracks down there where it had crossed over where that well was from the pond which was on one side all the way across that turnaround area and had stepped on i don't know what kind of rock this is but it's really soft rock and it had made an imprint on this rock so I remember my mom saying, what is heavy enough to do that? But it was a, a whole track line and they were like in between them. There was like five or six feet. So my mom wanted to identify the tracks. So she called my uncle because he knew everything that was in the woods. He had seen every track there was to see. And she told him, we have something down here we can't identify. And he said, I'll identify it. So he comes over and he looks at it and he says, I don't know what the heck that is. I've never seen a track like that before. So we were like, well, gee, thanks. You know, that's no help for us. So the biggest thing that happened was the night that we saw it. I was in my bed trying to go to sleep and I had the window open above the head of my bed with just the screen because we always like to open the windows. It was, I think early fall. It had to have been early fall because there were leaves on the ground. So we had all the windows open and my mom was in the next room next to me. She had been taking a shower and there was a small window there that she, it was one of those little twist knobs that you rolled the window out and she had the window open too. So I started hearing something walking and I could hear it sounded like a man walking and it was taking steps and it was crunching the leaves and then it would step on a stick and break the stick. And I heard it coming towards my window and I started to get scared, but I thought, well, somebody's out there. And then as it got closer to my window, I guess it got all the way up to my window. I could hear it breathing. And it was a a weird, deep, guttural breathing that I thought sounded like a football player with asthma. That's how I described it when I was 10. And I guess that's how I describe it now because I can't think of anything else. You could hear it when it would breathe in. You could hear it breathe in and then you could hear it breathe out both. And... It scared me so bad, I froze in place. But apparently my mother had heard it too because she came running to the doorway of my room and started yelling at me, Lisa, Lisa, get out of the bed, get out of the bed. And I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. And I wanted to move. I wanted to run to her, but I couldn't. I just couldn't move. And she finally made her way into the room far enough to reach my foot. And she started yanking on my foot saying, get out of the bed. Well, that finally broke the paralyzation or whatever was going on. And I jumped up and ran into the hallway with her. Well, my grandmother's room was across from mine. The doorway was straight across. She had already gone to bed, but she got up to see what's going on, what's happening. And we told her we heard something, you know, and she ran and got her gun and We ran to the kitchen because that was also on the back of the house. We were going to look out the window, but the window was too small and the sink was in the way. We couldn't see anything. So we went to the dining room window, which was probably three foot wide by probably about the same height. And 
we were trying to look out the window to see what was out there. And we couldn't see anything. It was just pitch black. And we couldn't figure that out because, like I said, the light on my granddad's shop would shine enough light for you to look out the windows at night and see things and make out shapes at least. And we couldn't see anything. And we realized when it moved away from the window to our left that the reason we couldn't see anything was because it was blocking the window. And here we are with our faces inches away from this thing. And we were a little freaked out when we saw it move away. It was big enough that it covered the whole window and we didn't see a head. So the head must have been above the window. But what we saw was big. It was dark brown. The hair probably, I want to say, four and a half, five inches long on this. And as a kid, I was thinking, why is this big man wearing a fur coat? It's not cold outside. And my mom and my grandmother are freaking out, which, you know, made me initially freak out, too. And I realized, you know, this is not a man. And so after that, well, actually, I had missed a part because one of the reasons that we went to the kitchen was because this thing had hit the back of the house really hard and it had shook the whole house. So my mother and grandmother knew it wasn't somebody. They knew it was something else. I, as a kid, just, you know, didn't know what was going on. But it scared me. And that night I slept with my mom. And after hearing the breathing, I wouldn't go back in my room. I think I had some PTSD from that and actually made my mother move the bed from that side of the room to the other side of the room where I wasn't near that window. But it always bothered me that I never saw the face or the head of this this thing. And it bothered me all those years that we didn't know what it was because we had never heard the term Bigfoot. You know, we didn't, we were country folk. (laughs) It's not like we went and watched the legend of Boggy Creek or anything like that. We just, we didn't know what this was. And right after that, my stepdad took me, which he didn't believe anything we told him, you know, he was like, y'all are just, bunch of women scared you're here by yourself you know he didn't believe anything but on his day off he took me squirrel hunting and we went into this same area which this area the whole area is known as middle fork bottom and they call it the bottoms because it's swampy it's dark even in the daylight you go in there and it's dark and it's so easy to get turned around and He took me there squirrel hunting, and while we were hunting, he had gotten like three or four squirrels, and we started hearing something moving, and he got a little shaken, and he was like, "Something, something's over there. Let's head back to the car. So we started heading back to the car. Well, he got turned around, and we got lost, and we started trying to find our way out and realized that whatever was moving was following us. And as we would walk, it would walk. And when we would stop to get our bearings, this thing would stop too. And I could tell that my stepdad was getting very unnerved about this, but he was trying to act like he wasn't because he didn't want to scare me. Because at this time, I think I was 11, maybe 11 and a half. So we were trying to find our way out. And at one point when we stopped, This thing let out a scream at us that I cannot describe um, like a horn and maybe a sick cow at the same time. And it was right next to us and it was really loud and it scared both of us. And I asked him, I said, what is that? And he said, I think it's just a cow. He didn't want to scare me. 
And I was like, I've never heard a cow sound like that. So it continued to follow us until we made our way out of the woods and actually found the car. And I could tell he was so relieved. But not long after that, while working, he was driving for Bo Gray. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but he was at a oil lease up in right on the line between Arkansas and Louisiana, not too far from Falk, Arkansas, as a matter of fact. And he had pulled up there and he had hooked up his hose. And I think he was, I don't know if he was loading or unloading. I really don't remember. But as he was doing it, he was sitting in the cab of his truck doing paperwork and the headlights were still on. And he happened to look up and saw something standing right on the edge of the forest. He could see it standing there and it was really tall. He said eight feet tall and it had red eyes reflected in the light and it was just staring at him. And he said it reached up at one point with a hand and pulled the branch down where it could see him better. It pulled the branch down to like its chest area. And it, at that point, he took off with the hose attached. Everything just took off, left, quit his job after that, came home. Wouldn't tell us what he saw for a long time. For the first few days, he didn't talk about anything at all. Just didn't even talk to us. And finally, he told his story and told us what he saw. And he said it was brown or dark brown, eight foot tall. He said it had hands like a person. And they wrapped around the branch like a person. And he said the body was massive. He didn't describe exactly how massive, but he said massive. And he said that it was tall enough that it was eyeball to eyeball with him while sitting in this 18 wheeler. And that's why he said it had to be eight feet tall. But like he said, the eyes reflected red, but he said it looked like a cross between a man and a gorilla is what he said. But it, he said it was so unnatural to see this that it, that's why he he quit his job. He didn't tell us the other part about taking off with the hose still attached, but I later found that out that even if he hadn't quit his job, he'd have been fired anyway because he caused this massive oil spill. But that's, I guess that's true fear when you take off with the hose still attached and just leave like that. He was so scared. After that, he, he made my mom, he told, well, he talked my mom into moving out of the country and into the city. And she did. Um, Kind of glad because I don't know what else would have happened if we would have stayed there. My grandmother moved with us and put the house up for sale. And we bought a, a home in the city limits of Homer, Louisiana. And after that, it was like until 2001 before I realized I got a computer and I started looking online and I realized that this was something that was called Bigfoot and that other people had seen this, too. You know, I'd heard about Bigfoot, but I didn't think it was real. I thought it was this legend, this myth, you know. And But then when I got that computer and started looking, I realized that other people had things happen that were so similar to what had happened to us. And I just got obsessed with it. And I started looking into everything I could find on it. And I started joining all the groups. <laughs> Anybody that was going out researching, I was going with them. And after I started going with them, I started thinking, well, let me try this on my own. So I started going out by myself. And I started trying things like the tree knocks. I tried that one day. And when I had pulled up to this area in Arkansas, in Polk County, Arkansas, when I had pulled up, it was so quiet. I had never heard quiet like that before in my life. And it was like 
so quiet that there was a lack of such noise that it, it created this weird thing in your ears, like a vacuum. And that was so weird. And I had my mother with me that day. And I said, this is weird. I said, let me get out and try knocking on a tree. So I got out and I, I got a stick and I hit this tree four times and I waited and I got nothing. So I did it again and I waited and I got nothing. And I was like, well, this don't work, you know? So I said, well, let me give it one more try. So I did it again four times. And then I threw the stick down and I started walking back to the car. And that's when something, it sounded so loud was like almost, I thought it was gunshots at first. Something hit a tree four times with something. And then you could hear that last hit. Something broke, a, like a big limb broke and then thud hit the ground. And I was like, oh, my God. I cannot believe what I just heard. So from then on, it was like this stuff actually works that I've been hearing. So I started going out camping and. One night I'm laying there and I'm it's about 2 a.m. and I'm listening to this thing howl. And it sounded so lonely. It was just this lonely howling noise. And I was like, well, that's not a coyote. I don't know what that is. And I thought, well, maybe it's a wolf. And even though we weren't supposed to have wolves in Arkansas, which is where this was, I thought, well, maybe it's a wolf. And it just sat there howling. And I probably listened to it a good 15 minutes, just howling on and off and then this barred owl landed in my camp and did that classic who cooks for you who cooks for you all call and when it did the thing that had been howling tried to imitate this owl (laughs) and I can't even describe to you what it did it it was this howling but it was howling the who cooks for you who cooks for you all And I was stunned. I was like, uh, what can do that? What does that? You know, that's not a wolf. That area turned out to be so interesting for me. I had a lot of different things happen there where I found trackways that were trails made where the limbs had been broke off seven foot up all the way down the trail and just twisted off or broken And it made a a loop around where it went up the side of this mountain and it had a bird's eye view of the campground. And it was a small campground. It was one of those primitive, maybe had five camp spots available. And it had a bird's eye view of that camp where that trail had led. And that was where the howling was coming from. So I started thinking, putting two and two together, I was like, Okay, maybe this is something. But I continued to go to that area for quite some time, but I never actually had a positive encounter. And I went out with some guys and girls to Sulphur, Oklahoma one time. And we were at this area of woods, and I can't remember exactly where we were, but we had night vision. And this was my first experience with night vision. I had never seeing night vision before and I started looking through it and I was like, Oh, this is cool. You know? And the guy I was with, his name was Robert. He was looking through it at one point and he said, look, look, I see something. And I looked through and you could see this thing with eyes and it was big and it was leaning out from behind this tree. And then it would lean back behind the tree again and then it would lean out and it would look at us and then it would lean back again and it did that several times and then it just was gone we don't know where it went after that but right after that I guess as it was leaving it let out this this scream this horrible scream and banged uh into something uh, metal. I don't know what it was, something metal. It banged into like a, a metal trash can or something like it kicked it as it was, as it was running away. And that was, re- that was really interesting. But, you know, I spent all those years going to different places. I've been to monster central where I had night vision with me then and something 
followed us as we were, we were, it was the middle of the night. We were walking through the woods. Something started following us and it would, it would make a moaning sound while it was following us. And we made a big circle around this property and it followed us the whole way. And it just kept moaning at us. And I had that recording somewhere and I need to find it. <laughs> but it wasn't until I joined up with the Bigfoot and Female Friends of the South, which is uh, formed in 2021 by Barbara Maddie and Elise Orr. And I met up with them, became their first member, as a matter of fact. And that's when things really kicked off for me with investigating. And I don't know if that's because we're all women. And the Bigfoot don't feel as intimidated by us as because there's no men there. We feel like we have that advantage because we've had a lot of activity that I never had when there were men around. And now that it's all us women, we're getting a whole lot more activity than I ever did before. I don't know if I can actually say that that's because we're all women or that they're just more active now than they used to be back then or more plentiful maybe. I don't know. But everywhere that we've gone, we've had stuff happen. I mean, the biggest thing was in East Texas. We went to one of the members, 800 and something acres she had there. And we had been there one day when three of us decided to go back to our camps and take a nap so that we would be fresh for the night. And two of them were sound asleep, and I was still awake. I couldn't sleep. I had this eerie feeling. And I just kept looking around because I couldn't sleep. And at one point, I sat up, and I looked, and I saw something big and black move through the, the woods right in front of where we were. And I was like, what is that? So... I got out of the car. Well, I was sleeping in my car. They were sleeping in tents. I was in the car with a camping thing on the back. I got out of the car and I started walking that direction and something whistled, which, you know, made me stop and look around to try to figure out where the whistle came from. And I looked in front of me and I noticed that something had taken leaves and had pine straw and had piled it all up all the way up to the top of the barbed wire fence, all the way up to the top barb and had made a blind and it was nowhere else on the fence all the way down. It was just in that one spot and it happened to be where we were camping. And I don't know why we hadn't noticed it when we set up camp there, but we didn't. But then I noticed it and I was like, well, what the heck? So I walked over there and I looked behind it. And I seen what I can only describe as a hut. We all called it a, a nursery after we all looked at it and took pictures. But something had taken, I don't know if they were big limbs or if these trees were already growing there. But they were sticking in the ground. And up at the top of them, there was pine straw strung all the way across for about 10 feet across. And about 10 feet back in a square that made a roof over this. And there was pine straw in the bottom, packed down. And it was dark in there. It was so dark. It was like night in the middle of the day. You looked in there and you couldn't see anything. And that was strange. But as I'm standing there, I started hearing this mumbling. And I'm like, what is that noise? Somebody's talking. So I, I went to the tent that uh, Elise was in, and I, I looked in, and she sound asleep. And I thought, well, did she have a radio on? There's no radio. So I went to Heather's tent on the other side, and she was asleep. She opened her eyes when I stuck my head in, and I asked her, I said, were you on the phone? She said, no, I was asleep. I said, you weren't on the phone? Did you say my name? She said, no. I said, well. I thought I heard my name, but I, what I was hearing was this mumbling gibberish, like almost like if you've got a radio sta a radio and you're going through the channels and it's not making any sense. It's like 
just creating words that you don't understand that you can't understand because there's no sentence involved. But I heard my name. And that kind of freaked me out because I thought Heather had said my name or somebody, but it sounded like a man's voice. So I don't know what I heard. I was like, what is this? I, I, I didn't know. So I just kind of blew it off. And that night, there were five of us got on one of the side by sides. It was one of the, the ones with the seats in the front and back. So we had three of us in the back, two of us in the front. And Britta, the landowner, she's one of our members. She said well, she's going to take us back into the what she called the back 40. But it was just a cleared off trail for them to get access to the back of the land that she took us on. And it went five miles back into the woods. And we got there and killed the engine, killed the lights, everything. And we're just sitting there quiet. And Britta got her FLIR out and she started looking around and she said, there's something over there. And it was to the left of us. And we said, what is it? She said, I don't know, but it is blank and huge. And we said, what is it doing? She said, it's just looking at us. She said, then she said, it just got down on all fours and took off towards us. And my friend Heather was up front with her. She threw the flare at Heather. She said, look. And Heather went to get out to look at it. But when she did, this thing came so close to us that we could hear it crashing through the woods and it stopped like two feet from the vehicle we were in, the side by side. It stopped like two feet from us and it threw up debris from where it stopped and it hit Heather's legs which made her jump and jump back in. And she said, turn on the lights, turn on the lights. Well, Britta's freaking out. And she realizes that she's got us facing a dead end and we're facing the wrong direction. So she just floors it backwards and finally gets us turned around. The whole time Heather's got the flare on that area and I've got the light waiting for this thing to come out. And it didn't, it never came out. It just stopped two feet from us. And later we watched the footage. And sure enough, you could see this thing standing there and it's tall and it's standing beside this pine tree. And you can see the head and the shoulders shaped like a man. And then you don't see it actually happen because it happens so fast that it's just suddenly on all fours. And it's running towards us. And then, you know, we're like, oh, my God, what is that? You know, and we realized that we just got charged by a Bigfoot, you know, and we get back to the camp area and we were, you know, still adrenaline adrenaline flowing just a little bit. And we're talking about what just happened. And this thing screams in the distance. And I said, what was that? And they were all talking so they didn't hear it. I said, something screamed like over there where we just were. They were like, we we didn't hear it. So they started talking again. And all of a sudden, not 30 seconds later, I guess, this thing lets out this scream that is like right there at us at the wood line. And it was the same scream that I had heard when I was squirrel hunting with my stepdad. It sounded like a tornado horn is what it started sounding like at first. It sounded like a tornado horn. And then it went into this almost like a train whistle that if you put a train whistle and a tornado horn together and that loud it 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 had to have been at least that loud if not louder and it went on for so long we were sitting there looking at each other going what is that and one of the ladies she jumped up she said oh no uh uh-uh and ran in the house there was a guest house there and the rest of us just sit there stunned and when it finally stopped we were like wow 
nothing can have lungs like that because it went on longer than 30 seconds. I mean, it was at least 30 seconds and then some before this thing let up. Right after that, everybody was like stunned. Another one from another area let out the same yell, just not as long and not quite as loud. And it came from the opposite side of where we were. So then we were like, okay, we're going to the guest house. We're going to stay there tonight. We're not camping because I think we angered something and (laughs) didn't want to be out there. If there was an angry Bigfoot, you know, we, we stayed in the guest house, all of us that night. And one of us wanted to camp out. The others were like, no, we're not going to let you because that thing sounds angry. So we all stayed in the guest house and we've been back there since. And we still had some stuff happen in that same area. That's one of our, most active areas in East Texas. But we've also been up to Arkansas. And when me and one of the ladies stayed up there in Arkansas, we were riding around on the side by side and something crossed the street in front of us that we think was a juvenile Bigfoot. It was, it had to have been, there was nothing else it could have been. It was about three foot tall on all fours and it had, Red fur, it was, well, I wouldn't say red, it was cinnamon colored, the color of cinnamon. And the hair was like five inches long and it glistened in the sun. And it was, it was so preened and pristine, not like you would normally see on a wild animal. This hair was just like somebody had brushed it. It was perfect. And it flowed in the wind when it was moving. And it ran across the road on all fours, didn't have a tail, nothing like that. But it moved like, well, like a, like a chimpanzee kind of would move. It only had one hand down and two feet, the back two feet were down in one hand. The other one was up. And as it reached the hill on the other side, it started grabbing the small trees and vegetation to help itself up the hill. And we never saw the head because it happened so fast. All we saw was the body and the back part of it and the hair. And I didn't actually get to see it. Um, My friend Heather had seen it and she hollered at me. But by the time I looked up, it was already going up the hill. So she got a whole lot of good look at it. And I didn't. But um, I think that same night. We were sitting out around the campfire and we were cooking steak and she has a little dog named Ben. He's our little squatchy dog. He's as sweet as can be. Never scared of anything. Never barks. You know, he's just quiet. You hardly know he's there unless you're cooking and then he wants a bite. But we were sitting out there cooking steak and something started howling. And it was off, you know, maybe a half mile, quarter mile, maybe a half mile away. And it was howling. And Heather was asking me, what is that? You know, because we're supposed to sit in there going, we don't know what that is. It's not a coyote. It's not a fox. And we knew it wasn't a big cat. We had ruled everything out. And we were still like, we don't know what that is. And we started looking and Ben was missing. And he had gone into the tent, which he never does by himself. He waits for her. He had gone in the tent, gotten underneath the cot, and in a bag that she had brought her stuff in, he was in that bag. He was so scared. And we were like, what the heck? He's never ran from anything before. So we were like, okay, let's just eat our steaks. And that was very unnatural because if there's steaks, he's going to be out there. But he wasn't. He stayed in the tent in that duffel bag, would not come out. So we finished eating. We were still sitting, and we heard this big thud. It, I mean, it sounded like something had picked up this huge log and had just slammed it down. And you could feel it, the vibration on the ground. And we were like, we just looked at each other, and Heather, she said, shine the light behind me because it was 
behind her. And so I shined. I didn't see anything. So she said, I think we should go ahead and go in the tents for the night. So we did. The next morning we got up and we started looking to see what had made the noise. There were no down trees or anything like that because we had had trees pushed down before, you know, so we thought maybe something pushed a tree down, but there were no down trees. And I started looking about 10 foot on the other side of my tent was a rock stack that hadn't been there the night before because we had looked around that area for everything we could find and we knew there was nothing there. Well, about 10 foot from my tent, there was a rock stack and it was a big, big rock. I mean, this rock, Heather and I together couldn't have picked this rock up. It was a good two feet long by about a foot wide. It it was, it was a boulder is what it was, but it was flat. It was a flat rock. And it was probably only two inches thick, but it was flat on the top and flat on the bottom. And it was laying there. And then there was another rock stacked on top of it that was a medium-sized rock. It was still a big rock, but not as big as the other one. And on top of that one was a little tiny rock about the size of a golf ball sitting on top of it. And we were like, what? is this because this was not here yesterday so i kicked it with my foot and when i did it tumbled because it was sitting like on an area where there was a little bit of a elevation and it tumbled down and the whole thing just fell i said okay that wasn't even really sturdy and you could see over to the left where the medium-sized rock had been sitting there was a spot there in the ground that was the perfect shape of the rock. You could stick the rock back in this indention in the ground. I said, well, that's where the medium sized rock came from. And we moved the big rock, flipped it over. And you could obviously see that it hadn't been there because the grass is still growing under it. You know, it's smushed down from the rock laying on it, but it's still alive. So that means it's not been there. So we decided that something while we were sitting outside, had probably dropped that big rock is what we had heard, which kind of unnerved me a little bit because it was only 10 feet from my tent. And I'm okay with going somewhere and encountering Bigfoot and other animals in the woods, but I'm not okay when they're at my campsite. That kind of unnerved us a little bit. But that was the one thing that happened up in Arkansas. The other thing that happened in Arkansas, we were sitting on the front porch of one of our members' house, and the one lady, Barbara, was the only one facing the direction of the back of the house, and she saw this thing walk, and it walked by. You could see through the window and see out the other window of this house, and it walked by that window, and we were like eight feet off the ground. This house had a porch that was raised and it had an overlook and it was in the mountains and this thing had to have been eight feet tall for her to see it go by but she thought it was a man and she jumped up and she said what is that and we all run to the back of the house by then it's gone she said it was solid black that's all she saw was solid black but this rabbit was laying there And the rabbit was freshly killed, and there was no head on the rabbit. The head had been pulled off, and the rabbit had been tossed in this little pen where where Lisa, the other Lisa, her little dogs would go out to go to the bathroom. It had been tossed inside that pen. And we were like, okay, this was not here earlier. So we assume whatever came through had a rabbit and left us a rabbit with no head. So that was kind of creepy. But um, then um, the next place was in Alabama when one of our members saw something cross over like a high line cutting and it was black and it was stooped over. And she said it looked like an old man. And the reason the rest of us didn't see it is because it had left footprints and we were casting the footprints And we're all over there casting while she's standing over there and she's seeing the thing. And she starts hollering, look, look, look. And by the time we all get over there, it's gone. 
and all we've got is a cast of the daggum thing. But she said it was hairy, it was black, and it was stooped over is all she could make out about it. And she said it didn't look natural. It didn't walk right. And she had never seen or experienced anything before. She started crying. She was very upset. We got her calmed down. But we've had, you know, a lot of activity. Trees pushed down. Things thrown at our tent. You know, we've gotten lots of tracks. Had growls and stuff like that. It's just been interesting since I've joined up with these ladies And basically, I think that probably brings us up to date. (laughs) Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies groove in where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track Come and have been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah In the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music The pace of the city life drives me wild The only tune is the cars rushing by on the stereo spinning When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Something got it backwards, backwards and double time Getting in the soul and the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out Best sweet tea, kind of sound.